Okay, I think we can start. Good morning and welcome everyone to the webinar Near Surface and Upper Air Climate Data. I'm Monica Proto, technologist at the National Research Council, and I'm very pleased to welcome you and moderate this webinar. I spent just a few words about the purpose of the webinar and some technical indications. Uh, the today webinar is the second of three arranged by the National Research Council in cooperation with the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecast and the Copernicus Climate Change Service. This cycle of webinar is focused on the use of in situ climate data and to provide information on the use of them, on their measurement and finally their applications. A wide range of data and services have already been provided under the Copernicus contract for the implementation of the C3S Climate Data Store. So I would like to thank all participants for attending this Copernicus training activity. Well, I'm so honored to introduce the two speakers who are two renowned international scientists. Welcome to Andrea Merlone, he is Senior Researcher at IRIM, the National Metrology Institute of Italy. He is Chair of the Working Group Environment of the Consultative Committee for Thermometry of BIPM and of the expert team Measurements Uncertainties of the World Meteorological Organization. He also serves as co-chair of the task group Air Temperature of CCT BIMPM and of the Permafrost Best Practice Group of the Global Cryosphere Watch. So welcome to Peter Thor, director of the Irish Climate Analysis Research Unit of the Maynard University. His main research interests are in observation of climate change he was coordinator lead author of the IPC's Working Group 1 Observations Chapter in Assessment Report 6. He is the chair of the Global Climate Observing System Atmospheric Observations Panel for Climate. Since 2003, he has been chair or co-chair of the GCOS Reference Upper Air Network Working Group. So the talk, uh, so I thank you both for accepting this uh, our invitation to take part to this event. And now some few indications, technical indications. The webinar consists of two sessions, the first held by Andrea and the second by Peter. After Andrea's presentation, there will be the questions and answers session 15 minutes long. The same format is for Peters as well. So please, I would I invite you, who would like to submit their questions to the speakers to write their questions in the questions box on the right of the platform. Finally, I want to remind you that the webinar will be recorded and made available on the C3S webpage. Now, I leave the floor to Andrea, please. Thank you, Monica. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you for your uh, introduction, but uh, first of all, thank you for organizing this series of uh, very interesting webinars uh, and, and also allow us to present and discuss some of the advances of our research in general, but with specific focus on the um, environmental and climate observation, uh, as you know. I try to, to share my screen, if you like, and just please confirm that you... Just okay, confirm. great, uh, okay. I can see you. Thank you, so um, basically I will, I will try to touch something uh, about um, how well how can we measure uh, a key uh, variable, which is air temperature, uh, which we will see 
uh, still poses open issues and, and problems. Um, thank you very much for your introduction. Actually, I am a little bit in between two communities, the metrology and meteorology. I am senior researcher as metrologist and associate researcher to uh, National Research Com Council in Italy, but I also serve uh, the World Meteorological Organization, the GICOS, uh, and as you reminded, the Global Crisis Award. So I'm trying to manage uh, how to, to better join the, the, the two communities. And the, the key word base and, and, and the key point are the measurements, which actually measurements are the best way that humans found to, to understand nature. By now, is uh, transferring something from a phenomenon to a number is the best way we can uh, compare and discuss about that. But that was clear years ago when uh, this man, who now gives the name to the temperature unit, uh, clearly talks the fact that if you cannot measure something, then you know very few about that. So you cannot improve it, you cannot communicate it, you know very, very, so measuring is to know. And what actually humans, what we do when we observe something, instead of just saying that that was uh, a God-given phenomenon, that lightning were uh, God punishment, now we, we change a little bit our mind, fortunately, and and we observe properties using something which is a sensor, but the sensor can be really a wide concept. But we, not only we need sensor, but we have to compare the response of any kind of sensor to a given reference, to something that we know how much this is. In the past, it have been that, and in the present, it's just what we call a calibration, what we call linking uh, the, the response of, of an instrument to a standard. But then the result needs validation. And this is the role of metrology. So the metrology is the science of measurement and it deals with the definition, realization and dissemination of the units, uh, prescription of calibration procedure and best practice. Also a little bit of terminology. And more recently, we went into the world of supporting users in the evaluation of the measurement set. Just two letters, but two clearly defined communities. Um, it's just a sketch, but actually we are based, and we, the two communities that were somehow recognized internationally, established almost in the same period. One is in Geneva, the other one is in Paris. And we know that the World Meteorological Organization is the agency of the United Nations um, structured into a number of uh, initiatives, a number of um, of systems and and uh, uh, structures. The metrology sits in Paris in Seb, where there let me say was there was the kilogram and the meter now we say why and I personally uh, stay in this building uh, which is the National Metrology Institute of Italy. The metrology uh, is based on the Convention du Maître that was a large treaty, now also signed by the WMO in uh, April 2010. So the WMO said, yes, we want to go into a meteorological approach. So immediately after, in May 2010, the BIPM, after the signature of, of, the, uh, of the WMO, um, prepared a recommendation to the national, each national meteorology institute to say, guys, it's worth we start a strong collaboration with the climate, with the meteorological community, in order to support improving measurement methods, data, and so on. And that was immediately reflected in our committee for temperature. This is why my talk is about temperature. And we started by thinking and creating a specific uh, working group on the environment. And what was uh, immediately reflected, the fact that at the first meeting of the committee, we got two Climatologists, and one of which is today here uh, in this webinar as speaker. So that was the sign of really connecting the two communities, 
that became uh, a real thanks, a real contribution when members from the BITN working groups started to serve the uh, WMO expert teams, contributing to, uh, as we say, the GRUAN, to the GICOS, to the, the GMON, the, the Guide of Instruments and Methods of Observation of the WMO, uh, the Quality, Traceability and Calibration expert team. I am uh, honored to chair the, uh, an expert team on uncertainties, which is formed by a representative, uh, including instrument uh, manufacturers, but trying to, to, to get uh, a forum for discussing uh, measurement quality. The metrology also publishes and, and updates key documents like evaluation uncertainty and also the vocabulary. So we absolutely need the common terminology to better communicate within and among communities and for a unique interpretation of terms, adopting a single language. There are so many uh, problems, even in tenders, even in uh, misunderstanding of cheat. And also to avoid com common mistakes. Uh, just give a look at this. For example, I don't like the term precision and never use the term error bus. There are uncertainties. Just a little bit of did you know? We have a new system of units that was adopted in 2019. Maybe some of you here know that, but that was the reason of my was was this. A uh, little cylinder of platinum iridium is now replaced, it's gone to the museum like the meter and it's replaced by the Planck constant as well as the Kelvin uh, still exists, the triple point of water, but actually the definition is based on the Boltzmann constant. And that was a way again for the science and for humanity to say we want to be linked, we want our primary standard to be uh, fundamental constant fixed values and we want to interact with nature. Problem that numbers are no more just one kilogram but that was the work of the metrologist of the last 30 years to be tied up. How do we link the fundamental metrology to everyday life through what we call the traceability chain? The traceability is a way to link any kind of measurement down to one kilogram of pepperoni in the market to standards through calibration. And this also happens in environmental science. So we have top level fixed points, and then we have different instrumentation going down in the, in the chain in order to achieve comparability, because we absolutely need to compare so many different platforms, so many different instruments, uh, but also um, approaches measurement methods and also measurement in times. If they're traceable to a common recognized standard, we improve the way we discuss and the way we compare our results. And today I want to focus among the many essential climate variables to air temperature. You know, it's, it's fundamental quantity. It's the most measured variable in a number of applications, not just on climate, but we do that constantly. In our house there is something that checks the temperature and controls the temperature of our house, our refrigerator, in our currency. And we know how it is important in meteorology and climatology, especially when we have extremes. When we have extreme temperature or extreme heat waves bringing heat actually and temperature or very cold extremes, or very high extremes, each of them now, WMO says, we want a validation process. We want to take instrumentation that recorded the extreme, take it to a metrology lab. This is that was happened in, in 2016 and 17 when we <clears throat> were requested to validate uh, Pakistan Kuwait top high temperature 54 degrees C, the top level ever reached in Asia. And we've done, there's a publication on that. Uh, we actually measure all the, all the parameters, all the conditions, and we included the uncertainty evaluation and we got the kind of that. You, you can see this in this, uh, in this publication, I don't tell you. Unfortunately, the same happened um, in 21 in Sicily, where 
uh, an alert from a station um, declare a very high temperature that, if validated, will become the high temperature ever recorded in Europe, 48.8 degrees. Uh, and again, the instruments are in our lab, and we concluded the investigation uh, recently in May this year. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot tell you if the uh, instruments were reliable, but uh, again, we did a very strong, a very strong uh, investigation on, on the devices. It's not only a matter of metrology. Um, IPCC tells us that we have scenarios, and those scenarios are based again on, uh, on the temperature. Uh, so it, we are calling warming. It means heat. It means measuring temperature. We need to measure this temperature with instruments. And we need to measure air temperature in order to establish a link with historical series, possibly with some uncertainties, with some uh, continuity, to generate comparable and high quality data for the future generations. The best we can do now, the best we will serve in the future. And to, as we said, improve the comparability around instrumentation. There is a but. Unfortunately, but this is an underrated problem. We don't have a definition of what we mean for air temperature. There is not a unique and complete way to evaluate a certain budget. And there is even not a way, an agreed best practice for the calibration of thermometers in air. We can do that in liquid, but not in air. So that's an upper problem generally, which is not limited to the metrology. So if I said that the thermometer measures the temperature of the air, where the thermometer, where the station, a meteorological thermometer, mostly may agree. But if you go in deep on how that works, you start wondering are we measuring the temperature actually? And is this the temperature of the air? Well, I prefer to say that a contact thermometer gives an indication. I, I, I'm even not able to say it's really measuring of the heat transfer, heat equilibrium, at that time in that place under those conditions. We are actually having problem in establishing if we're measuring air temperature. Because the equilibrium, I don't go into many physics, but the equilibrium is a help for factors. There is convection, conduction, radiation. All of them are well known by manufacturer trying to minimize errors, effects, quantities of influence by technology, by experience, by best practice, but are very, very difficult to evaluate numerically. Not only to the condition are not adiabatic, geometry is not perfect, and so on. And just to give you an idea of the complexity, if we were into ideal condition, if we move to real conditions, things are very, very difficult. It's almost impossible to make a complete model or, or a physical understanding for each of the different um, technological solutions and practical thermometers. And that's not the only problem. Because the contact thermometers are calibrated in adiabatic conditions. That means we establish, we, we stop things. Like when Mama said, keep the thermometer as long as possible, because you want the thermometer to measure its temperature, and you want that temperature to be the temperature of your body. But in the air, this is impossible. So we work in non-adiabatic conditions, in a continuous change of equilibrium in the heat transfer. And finally, there is a even another technical issue that stays in the calibration process that at some point we move from liquid to air. And this is something that we are trying to solve. And this is very clear. The BIPM uh, strategy clearly indicates we need to investigate air temperature measurement. We need to solve this problem. In Europe, we started in 2018 with a cooperative project. Uh, all the National Metrology Institute started a joint effort 
to better understand best practice, better understand the phenomenon of uh, the, the interaction of, of an object, which is a thermometer, with a gas, which is air temperature. And we discussed, we started intercomparing, we put all the experience of European laboratories together uh, in different ranges, and use even different kinds of thermometers in order to have a, a general, an overall um, representativeness of, of products. The work is going on. We, we concluded the, the, the comparison, we concluded the analysis, and we are starting to extend to uh, the BIPM this, um, this effort in little bit portions to complete this traceability are being developed. We will see the work going on, but there is really a huge effort, not limited to Europe, now BIPM is also working, and I'm happy that um, we also included the definition of air temperature and the uncertainties. This is aligned to similar actions in the WMO, like the recent publication of the measurement quality classification scheme that starts from the requirement of the OSCAR and transform the requirement into practical uh, prescription by identifying different components of uncertainty, different components of uh, operation in the instrument. For example, the measuring system, the calibration, which poses no huge problems or issues. We can calibrate things, we can uh, evaluate the hysteresis, the time constant, the drift, the temperature, and so on. The coupling. This is a little bit an issue. Radiation screen, for even for other quantities, there is a problem in how well they protect from the radiation and so on. But they can be solved with technology improvement. Maintenance and verification, okay, less prescribed, shorter time, and unfortunately a little bit of a cost, but it is worth to, to improve uh, the, the, the maintenance and the recalibration. But the real bad beast is in our, are the environmental effects. How can we evaluate all the many environmental effects which we cannot mimic, we cannot recreate in laboratory when we calibrate? the sensors. And also there is still the open of the site classification, how a place interacts uh, with the measurement result. But to my experience, this is more a uh, descriptive classification that deals with the representativeness of the measure and not exactly an effect on the sensor or on the data uh, measured by that instrument. So it's a task of our expertise on measurement uncertainty, besides the, 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 the overall terminology that we have seen, we also have to guarantee the, 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 the consistency of, the, of all of these components of uncertainty. And that was also uh, somehow established by an important recommendation, which in a couple of weeks time, we will have the Congress of the WMO, where uh, all of this uh, recommendation will become uh, fundamental uh, prescription for uh, agencies. Use terminology, harmonize terminology, and go ahead with uncertainty. So why worry about uncertainty? Because every measurement is subject to some level of uncertainty. We cannot pretend to know things perfectly. A measurement result is not complete if you don't say the limit, if you don't declare your uncertainty. But knowing the uncertainty helps to judge if the data is fit for purpose, if it is okay for what I want to know. And good measuring practice can help reduce the uncertainty. It's the first step of what we're using. And in the end, the uncertainty is the basic of science, a logic doubt, a logical doubt about the limits, you know, the truth. We are not in, 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 in religion, we are, we are scientists. We know we have doubts. We know we cannot know everything. There are no given facts. We have to discover things step by step, limiting and reducing our uncertainty. And why we need to relate that? Because we really, it's, it's a good fact. It, it gives a lot of information on uh, how to better apply the results, uh, how to, to declare to the users Take care, that's the uncertainty. 
That's the interval. But when you give a value to get rid of the uncertainty, you know everything about that. Without uncertainty, you know very few. And the uncertainty is not an error, because the error must be corrected as well as we know. And the uncertainty can be reduced, but not eliminated. If you live with errors, that's not good. And the uncertainty is not the error also, because if I have a cheaper instrument, I'm not making an error. I just have less money and a little bit of uncertainty. Completing the uncertainty budget, as you have seen, is not an easy, uh, easy task. Because there are so many components in the instrument, in its interaction with the world, in its interaction with the phenomenon, we want to transform into numbers. But slowly, we are working toward this. And for example, the Copernicus, the service, the C3S, the uh, lot that we are, uh, that invited us to for this webinar, made a really good example together with the NPL on trying to include all the many listed uh, um, facts that, that physically affect the near surface uh, temperature into a calculation tool, trying to, to reach as much as possible, because we know we can't, it cannot be complete. There is a lot of science still missing, but we at least, at least we can say as much as I know, that my uncertainty. But for example, when the rain starts, well, are we sure that the thermometer is measuring the air temperature and not an overcooling effect due to the water sprays and convection and evaporation and how long it lasts even after the rain is, is over or the albedo effect or so many other issues. But at least we start to focus all of them and say, I know this within this limit. And we started to test this. Uh, on a real case, which is the United States Climate Reference Network, the CRN, and we discovered that this is a very good example where the available data is almost 100% complete. We can try, start to try to, to put together the pieces and reach an uncertainty of 0 0.4, half of a degree. That's good. So, the GCOS is working on that. The GCOS now is really pushing after the, the, the Gruen, it's a talk we'll surely <coughs> talk about. The Gruen is on upper air and the GCOS now went on the land surface, so launching the GCOS surface reference network, which would be an interesting initiative for establishing reference data from uh, uh, near said land, land surface traditional stations. Um, it will provide sustained reference quality observation for a long term, fully characterized and with documented uncertainty possible. That's hard. We are working on that. We are trying to understand parameters to take all the experience that I've shown now in order to provide users with uh, certified data. We will follow the same process through uh, there is a lead center. There is traceability behind, and there is also science in support because we are promoting a project funded by the European Commission to support uh, the climate reference station um, concept by making measurements and, and even field or laboratory activity. So, as a conclusion, the present knowledge is not enough for completing the measurement and uncertainty contribution model. And we have seen field laboratory activities are required to promote, let's say, bottom up solution. People need to investigate in different environments, in the labs, outside, even going to the Arctic. We have a multitude of different products, all of them, they need uh, comparison, for example. WMO can push for comparisons. The WMO has just delivered this recommendation that there is a need for improving our understanding of uncertainties. And the technical solution constant report, and we hope that in the future we will be able not only to measure precipitation with non perfect system, but also temperature. That would really help. And we are starting in our expert team to propose a cooperation model where we will merge together through literature, through experimental results, through reported experience of the users, everything that we can to put together in order to 
transform just specific given values from normatives into really, really values, uh, evaluated values for, for uh, the, the users. And I conclude with this, what was, we started, because our meteorologist's point of view that we normally care for uh, so many, so many uh, uncertainties of the military, but actually by, by this new cooperation, we are starting to, to work together in the direct direction, in a correlation. So thank you for this. That was my talk. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for bring, bringing out your uh, great experience in this field. And uh, I'm checking the question box. Okay, there is a question for you now. Uh, is the near surface temperature measurement uncertainty calculation tool available to share? Well, I turned this question to C3S, actually, yes, because that was given uh, to C3S. And I think it's uh, open to public. And we will, and by the way, um, we are, as, as, as I said in my talk, we are working with the GPS, and the calculation tool that we developed for the C3S is now taken into serious consideration as a support tool for uh, stations approaching uh, and, and station candidate for the pilot phase of the um, GS REN, the GCOS surface reference So that tool, it works, it's being a little bit modified for the purpose of the uh, GSRM, for example, we will remove the sighting calculation um, because we absolutely focus the fact that the sighting is not an instrumental, it's a little bit to do with, with, the, with the instrumental uncertainty, but yes, I think it's open and I will be happy to, to receive a request and, and, um, and, and send this, this, this to, if I am allowed. Okay, thank you, Andrea. So, um, if you would like, I can uh, share your email uh, on the question box. So, if uh, there are some further requests for clarifications, they can uh, write to you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Then uh, there is a comment for you. Thanks for this excellent presentation, I confirm this comment and uh, if uh, there are any other questions I can uh, I think that we can uh, proceed with uh, Peter so I give the floor to Peter Pietro please can uh, grant him for uh, sharing his screen thank you all thank you Andrea Okay, thank you. Hopefully you can all see that fine. Um, so I'm going to give a talk on upper air in situ data, um, principally focusing upon those data that the contract um, that, that is providing these webinars provides via the uh, Copernicus Climate Change Services data store. So firstly, I'm going to talk a little bit about tiered networks and choosing the right data for the right task. Then I'm going to go through reference data from the GCOS reference upper air network, a little on homogenized radius sound holdings, and then a little taster of what's coming next in terms of what data might be available to users <coughs> in, the, in the coming years. Um, so firstly, tiered networks, and Andrea went into this in some detail, um, but observations are always undertaken for a specific reason, and it's important to recognize that. It's, it's furthermore important to recognize that for the majority of observations we take, even today, their primary reason is not for climate or for climate monitoring. It's for a broad variety of reasons. It might be for aircraft operations um, safety at, a, at, a, at an airport. It might be for crop uh, monitoring. 
um, in a rural region. It might be for weather forecasting. It might be for a whole host of reasons. But principally, many of the observations we take do not are not taken for climate. But the reason for the for, for taking observations can affect the quantity of measurements that are taken, the quality of measurements that are taken, uh, the spatial density of the measurements that are taken, and the long-term operation and stability of the measurements that are being taken. And it follows that all observations cannot be equal, nor should they be. You need the right tool for the right job. There's no point having a very expensive, very high quality observation if you do not need it for your particular application. So there is a need to better understand the variety of available observations and to make sense of this mosaic of capabilities. And as a community, we've been trying to push this for a while. And the good news is that it is becoming um, mainstream within uh, World Meteorological Organization. So um, at Congress uh, in the next couple of weeks, there will be uh, this put forward as a concept at this point. And the concept is variously being described as donuts or, or disks or other things. It recognizes that there's an inherent trade-off between the volume of measurements and the fundamental quality of measurements. Um, so as you move down through the tiers here from reference through baseline to additional, and then there's also ancillary or unclassified that's an even larger pool of measurements, you pay, you, 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 bar, you, you're, you gain in spatial density but at the cost of siting heterogeneity, at the cost of diversity of ownership and management. You can use those data for an increasing range of applications, but it comes to the cost of a range of data formats and archives and other things. As you move up, on the other hand, from, adi from additional through baseline to reference, you gain in terms of stability and long-term support, you gain in terms of the metrological understanding of the measurements, the uncertainty quantification, the open data availability and the metadata. The contract that's putting on these webinars is concerned with the provision of data fundamentally in these top two disks, reference and baseline observations. So I'm going to talk first about the reference data that is currently available on the, on the CDS. Uh, this arises from the GCOS reference upper air network. Here is a map of the stations that are registered as candidates or certified as Grand sites. Um, the green around circles implies that there is data available for those sites within Gruan. Um, now a subset of that and only a subset of that is currently served by the CDS. So what is this Gruan data? Well, Gruan goals firstly are to maintain consistent observations over periods of decades to validate satellite systems, to understand atmospheric processes, to improve fundamentally numerical weather prediction. There is a deliberate measurement redundancy aspiration in Gruan. So you should measure the same parameter in two or more different ways. There is a need for standardization and traceability, quality management and managed change, and the long-term aim is to measure all the upper air essential climate variables defined by GCOS, but we've got to walk before we can run. So in the first instance, we've been concentrating upon water vapor and temperature, uh, pressure wow. and wind. There's been a lot of progress on radius ons, um, but also increasingly with a variety of ground-based measurement techniques, including remote sensing techniques such as GNSS precipitable water. LIDAR and various radiometers. So what is a Gruan reference observation? What sets it apart from the rest of the observing system? 
first and foremost, it must be traceable to an SI unit or an accepted standard. It must then provide a comprehensive uncertainty analysis. It must maintain all the raw data so as we learn more about the instrumentation, we can go back and reprocess it. Similarly, it must include a complete metadata description. That is essential if you want to reprocess data in 10, 20, 30, 40 years time if we learn things. We can't guarantee that the person who made the measurement will be around, so we must maintain the full metadata. It's documented in the accessible literature and it's validated, for example, by any comparison of redundant or redundant observations. So what does it take to establish reference quality? So a Gruen measurement is the best estimate plus the uncertainty. And the key thing here is not to just take the Gruen measurement and use the best estimate and think, well, I'm using a reference quality measurement. You are not using a reference quality measurement unless you use the unless you in addition use the uncertainty. So there are green things, there are good things that we like. So we would like traceable sensor calibrations. We like the uncertainty of the input data. We like the transparent processing algorithm. There are certain things we definitely don't like and we can't include in a grand product, such as uh, black box software's disregarded systematic effects or proprietary methods that we cannot document and fully trace. So this is just giving you um, a view on what is required to consider in the Gruen RS92 product. So this is the processing chain of that product. And the important thing in here, this is uh, bindable, by the way, in Gaia Klim, um, which is a Horizon 2020 project that finished in 2018. What you see here is all of the processing steps that need to be understood, that the uncertainty in each of those steps needs to be quantified, the interdependency in the uncertainties between steps need to be quantified because this is a sequential processing. Um, so the shape, the magnitude of the uncertainty in each and every of these steps in here needs to be understood and it includes things like ground checks it includes um, data transmission it, it includes uh, smoothing and spike removal for example um, it requires it requires a solar radiation correction understanding so there's a whole host of things that go in here into the uncertainty and it can include things like payload configuration so a single RS-92 radius on going below uh, the free uh, below the balloon will have potentially a different set of uncertainties to a, exactly the same radius on but uh, hosted on a rig with multiple other radius ons or other instruments associated with the radius on. So there's a whole host of things that need to be understood and quantified. These are not simple measurements to make or to post-process in a way that enables that metrologically traceable uncertainty quantification. So that's the what in terms of what is this reference data, but let's think about how do you maybe use this reference data in a use case. So let's say we have a lidar which is a which is a laser based measurement technique where you fire a laser a high, highly specified laser pulse into the atmosphere and the reflectance of particles from, from part, various uh, species and other things back to a receiving disk provides you information fundamentally on atmospheric profile and you have from space a satellite measuring nominally some subset of the LIDAR measurement points. How can we make use of reference data in this use case? So we fire the LIDAR at night 
and we might fire the LIDAR only when uh, an instrument operator is available, which may be only during the week, and you only fire it during uh, cloud-free nights. So you have in this plot here a satellite series, which is quasi-continuous. The satellite might overpass at this location two or three times a day. Let's take, say it's a high-latitude station where you get multiple satellite overpasses per day. So you have this nice annual cycle from the satellite, and then you have these measurements that are discontinuous from the in situ. This is fairly typical. You do not, from most in situ measurements, particularly of the atmospheric column, you do not have a continuous series. You have these discontinuous point measurements. So you have these two, and it's great. They look like they have a reasonably coherent annual cycle. But they're not completely matching, are they? Um, there are points where the red is above, there are points where the red is below. Measurement A does not equal measurement B. This is a fundamental thing in any comparison. Does that mismatch actually matter? So you, the only way we can do this really coherently is by resorting to our friends and colleagues in BIPM um, Andrea and colleagues, um, and really look at the uncertainty in a rigorous way. Uh, so that's not error and accuracy, this is really uncertainty, um, and we need to distinguish contributions from systematic and random effects in the measurement. A measurement is described, always described, even a, perf even a reference measurement will always be described by a range of values. Uh, the perfect measurement is a bit like Santa Claus in the East, Easter Bunny. A perfect measurement does not exist. What does potentially exist is a perfectly understood measurement, where we understand all of the uncertainties, we quantify them, where we remove all the systematic effects. So M, the measurement here, is corrected for known and quantified systematic effects. And U is a random or quasi-random uncertainty. It might include structured random components, for example, that might be correlated in the vertical um, or correlated in time in some way. Um, it's generally assumed to be Gaussian, but it does not need to be. It could take any form you want, but it, it clearly if it's not Gaussian, you need to do some pretty hefty description of what that non-Gaussian term is. Um, but in the simplest terms, it's m plus or minus u, um, and there's a host of, uh, of, of literature that points out what this means. So let's put those on. So let's say we have the reference quality on these LIDAR measurements. So now instead of just crosses, you'll see that the, uh, the, 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 the vertical on these is now differentiated on each point measurement. Some of those measurements, the uncertainty, the vertical part, is much larger. Why might this be? Well, it might be that you could only measure the LIDAR for 30 minute integral, and on another occasion you could measure it for a three hour integral, and that three hour integral might be much lower uncertainty. Or there may have been some low cloud that came in for a period of time and increased the uncertainty. So as Andrea said in his talk, it's really important to understand the covariates, um, to understand and quantify for the effects of these covariates on the, on the uncertainty. So not every measurement that Gruan makes or any reference, measure, uh, reference network or measurement make reference measurement makes will have the same uncertainty. It will vary, don't be scared by it. This is because the uncertainty in the measurement varies for good reason. So that's good, we now have, we now have uncertainties on these and more of the measurements, if you like, are consistent um, in, a, in a very naive sense in that the red now overlaps with the black within the uncertainty quite often. What about the satellite data? We've so far treated the satellite data as perfect satellite data, like all observations is not perfect. Um, we could look and see whether it's within the uncertainty in the specification of the satellite build. 
that would be reasonable. Uh, I would prefer, of course, to have similar traceability on the satellite measurement, and there are colleagues working in other contracts in C3S and elsewhere in Europe and internationally on traceability, putting similar traceability on satellite measurements. So let's say now there's a, now there's a shading in grey here, which is simply the instrument specification for the satellite plus minus some specification on the satellite and now there's even more concordance between the red and the black series between the lidar and the satellite but it's still not perfect there are still cases where the two measurements are not consistent where there is no overlap between the uncertainties so if we have perfectly co-located measurements there are certain that there are principles that we can show. Um, so the difference, the absolute difference between the two measurements should be less than k, a coverage factor, times the square root of the two uncertainties squared. There is no meaningful consistency analysis possible without uncertainties. And we can use that, as I said, the satellite instrument specification. And you can look, and there's a, a, a calibrated vocabulary on what it means for different um, values of this parameter, this test to be met. So consistent, in agreement, suspicious, significantly different, inconsistent. It depends upon the value of K, and it depends upon what level of observations you're allowing to be outside meeting that specification. So that's what that table fundamentally means. But the main thing to understand is that we have a vocabulary which we can use consistently to do this uncertainty comparison. But what about co-location uncertainties? Well, let's, let's imagine that this measurement was undertaken um, for a period of 30 minutes on the outskirts, uh, outskirts of town or on a day with minimal or on a night with minimal clouds and that integration was taken at what from one o'clock the satellite on the other hand came in and overpassed at 2 30 in the morning it dwelled on the satellite on 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 the field of view for one second um, and its field of view is much broader. The LIDAR station is on the side. Furthermore, it was an off nadir view of the satellite. So the two measurements did not sense the same portion of the atmosphere in the same way at the same time. And the atmosphere is a fluid body, so it matters that you do not observe at the same time in the same way. So the co-location of coincidence matters and inflates the expected difference. So we need to determine the true geophysical variability of the variable being measured in time and space from measurements or models. And we need to incorporate this in the consistency check and it's incorporated in the way shown here whereby the sigma squared, the uncertainty due to co-location, is folded into the right-hand side of the comparison. And arguably, this test is only meaningful, i.e. the observations are co-located or coincident, if the sigma, the co-location uncertainty, is less than the uncertainty, combined uncertainty, in the two measurements. So this does place a constraint on when and how you can make these kind of comparisons. So it's all nice in theory with the toy model, but just to say this has been done in the real world um, using Gruan data from a sound. So this is looking at the full ERZ, the infrared, um, infrared satellite, high hyperspectral satellite from METOP. And this includes the full uncertainty characterization, including the ERZ stated instrument uncertainty, the co-location uncertainty, and the Gruan and its uncertainty. Um, and what we but what was found in here 
was that for the vast bulk of the spectral uh, region of ERC, that the ERC and Gruan data were consistent within their uncertainties after accounting for co-location uncertainty. So we can show this in the real world. This is a real world application of these reference network measurements. It's not the only application of reference network observations. So we did in preparing for the GSRN paper that uh, Andrea mentioned GSRN in his talk. We did go through and do a literature, research, re, re, literature review on the applications of two reference networks. So Gru and I've been talking about a bit, but there's also the US Climate Reference Network, which is a surface reference network. And this just gives an idea of the types of applications that these different reference networks have been used in. And it's fairly broad, and it's, it's more than just satellite calibra calibration validation. They've been incredibly useful in instrument development, indeed, uh, from talking to Radiosun manufacturers, many of the innovations in Radiosuns and improvements in Radiosun quality would not have come about without Gruen because it has pushed the instrument manufacturers to better understand their own instruments to meet the requirements of Gruen, for example. Uh, there's also data analysis, trend detection, NWP applications, other varied applications. So there are numerous applications of these reference network measurements. We don't have a lot of them though. These are the sum total of Gruan radius on launches that have been recovered by the Gruan Lead Center, and this was taken offline yesterday evening. So this is completely up to date. Um, we're up to yesterday. And you'll see that there are firstly each row here is a different station. You'll notice that some stations have never contributed data. That's a bit of a problem. Uh, that we are trying to overcome. There are a couple of stations that contributed and have closed in the Pacific, Manas and Nauru. Um, and then there are a host of sites that take different sampling strategies. So we don't have heterogeneity. You'll note that there is in particular, <coughs> my apologies, there is in particular Lindenberg, the lead center of the, uh, of the network that has four cents per day. So you do not get necessarily a huge global distribution, but you do get a fair quantity of observations from a number of stations through time from 2005 onwards. What are the data types that go in? So there are different radius on manufacturers Gruan is principally, but not solely, um, by Sala radius on network. That's the choice of the state of the sites that is not mandated by Gruan. And there are Gruan data products either in development or actually certified for more than just by Sala. Um, but by Sala sons make un undoubtedly the bulk of the network. And you're talking about typically uh, early in the network's history, 500 or so flights per, per month, uh, now in excess of a thousand consistently uh, with different radius sum types increasingly in play. So that was Gruen, but uh, as I noted, we've only got, with the, there are only about 15, 20 stations consistently making measurements. What if you need more spatial detail? Well, the first thing to note is we can't expand Gruan to be several hundred sites around the world. Um, it's not practical or financially feasible. It requires a considerable amount of technical uh, competence to run and maintain a reference quality measurement system to curate send that metadata to process it. It's not going to be feasible to have several hundred Gruan 
stations at any time in the future. There do exist many observations that do not have that full metrological tra uh, traceability. And they've often been maintained very well, but undoubtedly they have had many changes in instrumentation and methods of observation through time. This is particularly prevalent, of course, for radius sons. And the reason for that is that radius sons are typically use and forget instruments. We do not typically recover them because the cost of recovery would far outweigh the cost of utilization. And they are, they therefore, as they're single use instruments, there is a greater propensity to change instrumentation through time. These global data, because they've had many changes in instrumentation and methods of observation, and it for surface data, as, as Andreas said, things like the sighting has changed through time. Uh, so all kinds of these have all had changes and they thus require quality control and homogenization before use. Quality control removes various outliers, so specific points for very specific reasons, whereas homogenization is needed to identify and adjust for systematic breaks in the time series that arise for non-climatic reasons. So you need both to quality control and homogenize. Why do you need to homogenize? Well, these are from the lead center in Lindenburg in for Gruan, but these go back way prior to Gruan quality measurements being undertaken. So these go back all the way to before the Iron Curtain um, in, in 1960s. Um, and what you see here is the time series at eight kilometers at midnight UTC uh, for relative humidity over liquid. And that looks a really interesting time series. There's lots of apparent behavior in here with re relative humidity at that eight kilometers height changing by 20% plus over the time series in interesting ways. Well, why does it change? If you look at the history, and we're very fortunate with Lindenburg to have this rich history because it's one of the foremost atmospheric sounding sites globally, um, with, with uh, practices dating back even further than this plot to 1900 with uh, meteorological kites. And if you ever get a chance to go to Lindenburg, go do look up the Meteorological Museum which has really interesting and rich history of measurements, including a thermometer measuring in Newtons. Um, but I digress. This is here is really about showing you the variety of instruments that they have used to sense this over time in the pictures and the time series of when they were used. And all that interesting, that interesting behavior that you were getting all scientifically excited about explaining pretty much is explained by the changes in instrumentation. So these are not real geophysical signals. These are signals brought about by changes in instrumentation. So how we, what we sense and how we sense, and it even explains things like changes in apparent variability um, are very well marked out by when we change between instrument types. So that's why we need to homogenize. Otherwise we spend time scientifically chasing our tail trying to explain things that are not geophysical in origin, but are measurement in origin. So we do offer via the, uh, via the Copernicus data store what are currently one set of homogenized radius sound holdings and also the raw data. So the raw data is IGRA, the Integrated Global Radius Sound Archive. It's maintained and prepared by NOAA and CEI, who have very kindly let us host it. Um, and AHAM is a homogenized series prepared by the current contract uh, using a subset of those stations. And the AHAM algorithm you can find in the paper linked here um, in the top uh, by the contract led by the contract lead uh, Fabio Madonna um, at CNR. And 
it includes a couple of things. So where we can, where we can use, where we know the sites use data that data that is in processed in Gruen, and we can ape certain aspects of that processing. So for the post 2004 period, we can ape certain aspects of the processing to look like Gruen. And then we can also look at the data earlier to that using statistical techniques. So we merge those time series, we perform a breakpoint detection and adjustment and an interpolation to significant levels. So this is an effort to create homogenized series at the launch level and for both standard reporting levels. So there are about 15 or so standard reporting levels that must be reported in each radius on descent. And then there are significant levels which are operated defined levels where something interesting happens in the profile. So typically these would be inflection points um, in the vertical profile. Historically, radius on data were not transmitted as the full profile. Uh, with the move to buffer and with improvements in global telecommunication, increasingly and thankfully, the full radius on profile is being transmitted and is being archived. So for recent years and moving forwards, there is an increasing hope of really having the full profile not just the subset of profile values but when you go back in the historical archives the norm is that the radius on data has been thinned to significant levels and standard reporting levels that all sounds good but i want to be very very explicit here beware the structural uncertainty beast this homogenization is an inherently uncertain business. We're effectively chasing a huge number of no unknowns around an undersampled solution space. We don't have observations everywhere. We don't know in many cases when instruments changed, particularly in the past. We don't know other changes that might have occurred. So it's inherently a statistical problem and it's inherently an uncertain problem. Different, entirely reasonable methodological choices regarding data selection and processing can lead to very substantial differences in how we then, in the estimates that result. That is the fundamental reason when, when, when while you look at assessments such as those performed under IPCC in the WMO State of the Climate, you will always see, whenever there are multiple data sets, you will always see those in their assessments. They never choose one data set to use. They always look at and encourage the use of multiple data sets because it strengthens your assessment. So I would strongly encourage any users to consult, cons consult and consider multiple homogenized series in their work and many of these users will have to go to many of these users will have to go to host repositories to get them. They're not served by the CDS. But irrespective of whether it's in situ, whether it's upper air, whether it's surface, whether it's satellite, none of these homogenized series are perfect. And it is really critical that you look and think about the uncertainty in the homogenization process. So finally, what's coming next? Uh, for Gruan, uh, my understanding is we will shortly present RS-41 and IMS-100 radiosons and updates to present. Uh, my hope is that we will also be able to provide the very first um, surface-based remote sensing series which is from GNSS precipitable water so this is taking um, column water vapor value estimates from monumented GNSS receivers um, and the noise for the for the primary purpose of GNSS which is for monitoring small changes in uh, in in the crust um, and earthquakes and other things is our signal in meteorology because that noise principally arises from 
wet tropospheric dis delay processes. Um, and we've provided those as a grand time series now it's certified and my hope would be that we can get those onto the CDS. Um, for radius sons in the CDS, a couple of things. There will be access to ad additional homogenized series from University of Vienna, um, which have been incredibly important in informing uh, IPCC assessments, but also assessments by WMO and others, um, and have, uh, have a rich heritage of decades of analysis and improvements. Um, and also we will have improved holdings for the existing AHARM data, more, more stations, improved methodologies. So the other thing to be clear about is don't think it's one shot and, cut and gone with homogenized series. Do check back occasionally because we might improve them over time and we might reissue them. So that's it. Um, Hopefully that was uh, somewhat informative and useful to you. Uh, time for questions, and this is just a note, a dual, a dual flight of two radius suns as part of comparison for Gruan to understand uh, the RS-92, RS-41 transition um, that was forced upon us by the manufacturers. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for your uh, so clear presentation explanation uh, for all. And uh, we have uh, some, uh, there are some questions. I try to share my screen. Sure. I'll stop sharing mine. Sorry. Okay. Pietro? Could you give me the authorization to share the screen? Okay. Okay, can you see my the questions? I could do for a second. Okay, uh, there is one comment for uh, Andrea. I don't know if uh, Andrea is uh, um, Andrea. Are you here with us? Okay, uh, we can uh, go to the question three for you, Peter. He's here. He's here. He's just put this video on, Andrea. Yeah, because okay. I was not allowed to join. Okay. So. But I can't see my screen now. I don't That's know okay. why. We, we can see your screen. So question one, you Andrea. Can. Is, you uh, can. Now I can't. Now you've removed it. Now I can. Okay. I don't know why. Now. Okay. So for Andrea, uh, okay. Thanks for sharing your experience. And uh, could such uncertainty review and methods will be shared by using globally? especially in limited resources countries such in Middle East? The question is by Ashi Billy. Uh, again, I think so. Uh, why I say I think so is because the tool was developed for the internal use of C3S. Uh, my feeling is that there is no restriction, there is no copyright in that, and when it will be part of the GSRN or an adapted version will be adopted by the GSRN to support their stations, um, then it will be surely uh, made uh, public. Uh, and by the way, the, the, um, the GSRN is uh, uh, shared, the lead center is China, so for sure uh, the, the Eastern country will have a central role uh, also, there is a strong recommendation for Eastern countries to candidate pilot stations. Uh, we, we well know how, how is it important that we have globally well distributed reference data. Um, and for sure, uh, I feel to say yes. So, if, if uh, should you want to write me, just I, I can send you something. And thank you, Stephanie, for attending. 
I say the question is yours. So. Okay, thank you. And uh, for Peter, the third and the fourth question is for you. You can uh, see, Peter. Yep, sure. So, um, Gruan can be accessed in two ways. One way is via the Copernicus data store that, that allows access to two specific radius on products. It is, it, is, uh, it is limited to 2020. You can also go to www.gruan.org um, and there you can there you can access and find information to all the data products that are currently given and it provides a wealth of additional information um, on how to get on, on what with what data has been taken where what data is processed um, question four uh, M in that equation that I gave, the M plus or minus U, and is is the processed um, the best processed measurement estimate. It is the measurement estimate after the removal of known systematics. Um, so it does capture any seasonality and variability in the climate to the extent it is understood in the measurement itself. Um, so I think I think there may have been uh, I may not have explained that very well. Um, I did try and show that um, traceability diagram for the radius for the RS92 product from Gruen. We do really go through and try and understand all of the known terms that could affect. So. Um, it is always accounting, for example, for the differential in the solar radiation effect on the on the radius sun. So it's a different processing for a radius sun descent in the middle of the day in Singapore than it is in polar night for the Um, because the seasonality of that effect um, and the magnitude of that effect varies by location. Um, and varies seasonally, and that is absolutely taken into account. So um, that's uh, well, that's one reason why the plus or minus U on the M value might differ by station. It's not necessarily that the station in the Alessand is better or worse than the station in Singapore. It is that the fundamental uncertainty in the correction might be different for. 70 odd degrees north than it is for one degree north um so yes we do we do we do always process in these in these reference networks we do always process um accounting fully for seasonality and variability to the extent we can andrea did you want to answer the question too yes i I have another question I'm reporting here in real time because now I don't know if you can see. So the the question okay. five on the question five on heights. Um, yes, there are there are there are observations. So the Gruan profiles are for the are for the full radius sound. So it is the full radius on descent from the moment of release. Um, the uncertainty in the values in that very lowermost component are quite high, particularly for wind speed and wind direction, because upon the release of the radius sound, it's not, it's swinging and doing all kinds of things, particularly in a windy situation, because you're going from a you're going from a situation of a balloon being effectively tethered by human contact to the ground to a free atmospheric profile. So I'm not convinced as to what the value of those data would be. The uncertainties are quite large in particular in that until the, until the balloon reaches some kind of equilibrium with, the, with the equilibrium and its transport with the surrounding atmosphere. Which takes some tens or hundreds of meters of ascent time. Okay, thank you. And other questions? I'll try to. 
report in real time. Just okay. Okay. Okay, question Can six. Um, yes. <laughs> it would be really nice to think that you could do that, but don't be fooled into thinking that reanalysis, because it's data without gaps, is data without issues. Uh, reanalysis itself is, of course, using data assimilation, often using, often but not always using the same raw data as is used in homogenization, and it's as imperfect or perfect as homogenization itself. Um, I would love to be in the situation where reanalysis was some unimpeachable truth, but uh, reanalysis has its own challenges as well as strengths. Um, undoubtedly, its real strength is, is that it is data without gaps and that it provides information on unobservables. Um, so things that we things that we really can't can't observe. Um, but are really, really important. So yes, um, you, certainly reanalysis is used, for example, in the WMO state of the climate era six, era five, and when it comes era six, will be it will continue to be used in the assessments, for example, of surface uh, temperature. But uh, reanalysis is just one other estimate with its own strengths and weaknesses. So another thing is always use a variety of sources of information. And one of those undoubtedly is reanalysis and it has significant strengths as well as well identified and well documented weaknesses. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, it seems there are no other questions. So... I have a comment if I can. Okay, please. Uh, but the first comment is that my talk actually was on what we call the type B uncertainties and I have not touched the statistical uncertainties on big data which somehow Peter uh, talked about. So my, my, my talk was on the, on the instrumental uh, effects, if you like, even on a single value measure. So there is a, a huge portion of other uncertainties linked to the statistical uh, method. And the second uh, comment is an answer to a question I received uh, uh, by email, not on the chat. I cannot spoiler the end of the movie because WMO has strict rules, but about the Sicily record, then I can just say that the meteorological analysis show that unfortunately the instruments even show a sort of underestimation of the value. Uh, but that will require the complete uh, process to be complete. Okay, thank you, Andrea, for your final comment. And uh, thank you for your excellent presentations. Um, okay, I think that we can uh, close this uh, interesting webinar. Thank you again, Andrea and Peter. Thank you, Monica, and thank you all for organizing. Thank you. Bye. Bye, perfect. Ciao.